In the meantime, everyone can come back inside and sit down. Let me know when, Jolly. We good? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, it is afternoon, barely. So um, this afternoon, we're going to talk about um, some interesting, in my opinion, technology. So first of all, my name is Greg Richardson. You, you saw me already. Um, this is Jesse Nets, um, also known as Mr. Acronym, because he likes acronyms a lot. Um, he's an engineer at McAfee, um, highly vested in this technology. Definitely one of the field leaders in the technology. He doesn't know I was about to say that, but I genuinely think that about him. He's built some of the very, very, very cool integrations, which you guys are going to see um, a little bit later on in the demo. Um, I think this topic is important um, because, in my opinion, it solves a lot of our cybersecurity problems. So we are obviously plagued with cybersecurity problems today. Um, it's more visible now than it was, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, but they existed 5, 10, 15 years ago as well. Um, they just have more repercussions now because we've put more stuff up in that cyber field. What I found from my work in cybersecurity over the years, uh, a couple of things. Uh, well, to start off, it is known military strategy that wars are won by a lot of intelligence. So that's why intelligence organizations exist. The w wars are not won because you got a bigger bomb or whatever, whatever. Inevitably, someone found out something about someone. All the way back to the, I think it's called American Independence War, whatever you want to call it, you know, the, the war against the British, et cetera. That was won because of intelligence. There were spies that were spying on the British, you know, dressed as, you know, acting as uh, laymen, garbage collectors, tailors, whatever have you, and they were filtering information back to the, the, the independents, so to speak, the Americans, what we know as Americans now, and you know, that helped them t turn the tide into war. So it wasn't because they were better armed or they were better fighters or anything along those lines, it came down to intelligence. What we've built in cybersecurity now or in, in the cyber realm now is a bunch of tools that are, for the most part, very disseparate. So inevitably, inevitably, this goes to my point one on cybersecurity. And yeah, I got some slides. I'll get to them in a second. Um, this goes to my point one in cybersecurity. Almost every single hack that you read about, Target, Home Depot, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, Kmart, um, Buckle Stores, all of them. Um, inevitably, those companies had technology installed in their networks that not only could detect this is a bad file, you shouldn't be running it, but actually did detect it. But what happens is those technologies do their little detection and they tell themselves about it. So now your firewall knows that file is bad. Doesn't bother to tell any of your cash registers, so your cash registers are merrily we roll along, roll along running that file, but someone knew it was bad. Maybe your network is properly set up, that someone sends it off to your SIM, and if I'm using too many weird tech terms, please interrupt and ask, because I'm here to you know, give you knowledge, so if I say SIM and you don't know, stick your hand up and ask me. I mean that very seriously. I'm not gonna lose my train of thought. Interrupt if I say something that sends you down a rabbit hole. Um, so you, know, you pop up, a, a, a send an alert to your SIM, then your SIM is gonna go out and you know, alert a million people in the incident response teams. Those guys are probably overworked already. They're getting bogged down by alerts on firewalls saying this and that and the other and et cetera. So it just gets into the white noise. So that paradigm doesn't work well. We need something in cybersecurity that takes all those separate competitive tools and kind of blends them in together to say, hey, if Mr. Firewall detects something or Mr. Malware Analysis Device FireEye, what a cuckoo, whatever you want to call it, detects something, kind of be cool if it shared its threat intelligence with the rest of the environment. That's what DXL is all about. So fast forward to about, so DXL is just a bus, a communications bus, and let me snap back one slide real quick again. DXL is just a communications bus developed by McAfee um, probably about seven or so years ago. Don't hold me to the dates, but what the bus does is absolutely correct. It shares urgent threat alerts. 
stuff that happens right away and you need everyone to know about this, drop everything, this is key or important data. This is a bus for sharing that type of information. Works on a publish and subscribe methodology. So all of your endpoints, your mobile devices, your laptops, your cash registers, whatever have you, whatever type of environment you're in, they subscribe to that bus and then if me, Mr. Firewall, detect something and I ping down to the bus, everyone that's subscribing gets that content immediately. So it's not a Mr. Firewall now needs to reach out to 7,000 um, IPs of you know, cash registers and 3,000 laptops and 2,800 you know, mobile devices. That's not the way it works. It is publish and subscribe. Very straightforward, very high performance um, paradigm. What I wanted to say about OpenDXL is, while we developed it as McAfee, you see our new logo is together, our slogan is together is power. We believe in that very passionately. So I'm going to start off by saying this is not a technology that only works based on you running only McAfee stuff in your environment. Quite the opposite. In the marketplace, cybersecurity, where we're still kind of um, kids playing in a sandbox that don't know how to play quite yet. And if I touch your toy, you know, you, you're banging me, you're calling your mommy and your daddy, and all kids are in a sandbox. Cybersecurity as a marketplace, as an economy, is very, very much like that. You know, a problem comes up and something bad happens. It, rather than we say, hey, let's um, see, you know, how can we address this problem together as a marketplace, we're still at a very immature state where we run off and go and hide in a corner and say, if I could figure out how to fix this first, I could start up and play, I'll make a billion dollars. One of the panel speakers earlier today said, we have a culture now in our entire world where if I can make an app and you know, sell that one app, that's it, I'm good. That's all I need to do. I don't need to have a trade, I don't have a living, I don't need to have a talent, I don't have a skill. I just need to come up with that one lucky app because Instagram did it and they got sold for X billions of dollars and that was five guys, so you know, if I could do that, I'm good. FYI, that's a low, 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 um, availability, risk of rate of success, you may want to try something else. That's tantamount to, I'm going to go out and practice basketball every day because, you know, basketball players make millions of dollars. Yeah, there's hundreds of billions of, well, hundreds of millions of people in the U.S., and there's, what, 50 to 100, to maybe two, three, 400 basketball players making a couple million dollars. The odds are, in your, are not in favor that you're ever going to be a successful basketball player. Odds are the same thing with being an app writer. Odds are not in your favor that you are going to write a billion dollar app and you're going to live, uh, get out of your mother's basement that way. <laughs> Come up with something better. That's unrelated to OpenDXL, but had to share that. So back to OpenDXL, you don't need to own McAfee Technologies to work with it. It very purposely tries to be mature and say, you know, we need to work better together as an industry. So that's where the paradigm of OpenDXL starts. Let's talk about the technology a little bit. I said it is a bus. So it's only a communications infrastructure. It's based on an open protocol called M, and I'm gonna get a little nerdy. I am very much a nerd. My handle online, some of you probably know, is called the Tea Drinking Hacker. I have been a hacker way before it was cool to be a hacker. In other words, I was the guy getting beat up in school, in high school and uh, primary school. Uh, look at me now, ha, 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 I got the last laugh, at least up until this point. Um, but for real, that's for real how I grew up. I was the nerdy guy in the corner. I'd rather read a book than go and talk to a girl, kind of still that way. Um, it is what it is. I, I owned it from then, I still own it now, that's who I am. So I will get nerdy occasionally and throw up some weird acronyms. Stop me and ask me if you have a question. So it's based on MQTT. MQTT is an old protocol designed, I think, by IBM. Quote, correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, years ago, and it's called Message Queuing Telemetry Transport. So it is designed for telemetry, bursts of small data. That's important for throwing it out on a bus and having that bu bus shared. FYI, some technology that uses MQTT. Who has an iPhone in the room? Don't show your hands because you should be ashamed of yourself because it's crappy technology. But probably lots of you have iPhones. Me, I'm a droid man myself. Those are good phones. Jesse sucks. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's an Apple guy. I am not an Apple guy at all, just on principle. But um, iMessenger uses MQTT as part of its protocol for that, you know, that ping where you uh, are in a group chat with a million people. They're all over the world. Some of them on 3G networks. Some of them are on high, high speed Wi-Fi. You go inside the chat program. You say hi. Everyone gets that hi at the same time regardless to what their device is. That's based on MQTT. Same paradigm, same technology built into DX or DXL is built on. Key paradigm here. 
What we did when we said we're gonna take MQTT and make it into this security-based bus, obviously the first thing we layered on it was security. So we took the open protocol of MQTT into our labs, we're a software company, McAfee. We redesigned it, looked at it, reevaluated, layered security on it for the simple reason of we're saying, look, we're not building a bus to share hi on iMessenger or share a pretty picture. We are building a bus from the ground up to share what's probably going to be mission critical security information. So we have to be cautious on who can publish and subscribe, who can consume that information, and who is actually giving that information out. So if you are communicating with me on DXL, that means I know who you are through a public key infrastructure and I can authenticate that it's the guy in the pink shirt with the braid and it's not the guy with the yellow suit in the front row. I need to know who I'm getting the information from so that I can trust it accordingly. I don't trust the guy in the yellow suit, the guy in the pink shirt looks like my kind of a guy, I trust him more, I'm gonna allow myself to share with him in DXL, I'm not gonna allow the other information. Th that paradigm needs to be built in there. We built that. <laughs> Total hypothetical. I more trust him than you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you really do look more like my kind of guy, though. Um, so that paradigm is built into the technology from the ground up. We've secured it with TLS 1.2. Interesting thing happened. When we took this already existing protocol, brought it into our lab, re-engineered it, and put security on top of it, we started seeing an improvement in performance. So we got a 80, 80x improvement in performance over the base protocol by our re-engineering. So we obviously re-engineered the bejesus out of it. What that means is this protocol is designed to work well on all networks on purpose. So if you have security infrastructure that is out in Latin America on a 128 ki kilobit per second line, it works equally as well with DXL as if you're in a data center somewhere in a 10 gigabyte pipe. Same type of performance, why? Because we're doing bursts of small amounts of data, this bad, this good, don't allow this, block this. Not transmitting a whole bundle of here's a new update to my new antivirus dictionary signatures or whatever have you. So DXL is designed for that bursty transmission of quick data. So that's part one. Let's talk about like what's built into it. I already touched on publish and subscribe, and I've obviously touched on McAfee product offerings. So as of the last, I would say five, six years, somewhere thereabouts, all McAfee products speak DXL. So that means the endpoints this, that has McAfee antivirus software that you've all loved and heard. Heard one guy tell me at a, at when I was speaking about this somewhere else a week or so ago, that McAfee was the first software that he pirated back in the bulletin board service days. I thought that was very interesting because it's that old. I think it's like 30 years old, the company and the software. But we do a lot more than that. We got next gen, well, we don't have next gen firewalls anymore. We used to. We have IPSs, we have DLP devices, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those products, web gateways, all of them speak, Mac, speak DXL. We have a very large partner ecosystem, big companies like Checkpoint, Airwatch, Vecto, Forescout, et cetera. They speak DXL natively as well, and they have the ability to build it into their products. What we're talking about today is open DXL. Why? Because we noticed, as we were talking about this to our customers, inevitably, someone in the room like you guys would stick up their hand and say, yeah, but do you integrate with company blah, blah, blah. And as you know in cybersecurity, I already inferred it earlier, there's thousands of companies popping up every year in cybersecurity because it's very profitable. At a certain point, we're getting a lot of VC capital, so it was the place to go if you wanted to try to write the billion dollar app. So for that reason, we got a lot, a lot, a lot of companies. Go to RSA, go to Black Hat, which is I think next week, Black Hat, DEF CON, walk around the vendor space, you'll see thousands of companies. Why? Because there are thousands of companies. So inevitably, we would get the question, do you integrate with company X? And probably the answer would be no. A, because the marketplace is immature, very competitive, so I can never partner with blah, 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 because they're blue and they're yellow and I'm red, and yellow and red, eh, you know, we can't play together at all. OpenDXL attempts to solve that. About two years ago or so, we opened the protocol up and we said, in addition to McAfee offerings and partners, 
anyone can now write an integration to it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Writing your own integrations. And Jesse is going to demonstrate writing them with Python. But we're also opening up the ability to write them with Java. I want to say C++. And there's probably going to be other vectors as well. Um, you can download that open API and the whole SDK framework with code samples and everything else for free today on GitHub. Just go on GitHub and literally Google GitHub open the Excel and the whole framework is there, pull it down and you can do all of this integration. Um, yes, GitHub, open the Excel and you can get it all, it's 100% free, you can start coding that and Jesse's gonna actually show you some stuff and a lot of his stuff is up on, on GitHub as well so yeah, I, you'll be able to pull that down. I've Bear included links at the end of the deck. Perfect, perfect. Um, so that's what open the Excel is. How does it actually work in an environment? And I got a ton of slides that I'm going to skip over not this, not this, not this, not this, not this. I'm going to let Jesse walk through. There we go. This is what I wanted to show. So how does it actually work in an actual high-level environment? Got an environment, have a whole bunch of security infrastructure, email gateways, next-gen firewalls. Maybe it's a Palo Alto device, a competitor of ours. Maybe you have a, a sandbox from us, or maybe you have a sandbox from FireEye. doesn't make a difference. You have the DXL bus communicating in your network with all of the devices, all of the computers, the servers, the cloud-based workloads, et cetera, they are subscribed to the bus. All of your infrastructure is you know, subscribed and publishing onto the bus as well. A file comes in through email. I picked email because when I made this slide, email was popular. Nowadays, with um, Double Pulsar, WannaCry, uh, Petya, et cetera, email is becoming less popular, and we're attacking now via just SMB shares and just open, you know, open ports in that manner. Different conversation, but the, 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 the principle remains the same. File comes into your network, or maybe fileless, and uh, an attack vector comes into your network that we have no signature for. No one in the world has a signature. It's new. Because of how easy it is to get pieces of malware now, you could literally craft one. I could make a malware specifically for you. Because I've done a fingerprinting on you. You have maybe an iPhone, because you look like an iPhone type of a person. So I'm going to make a targeted malware to attack your iPhone specifically. No one else has ever seen it. McAfee has never seen it. Symantec has never seen it. What does that mean? They don't have a signature for it. That's the type of attacks we're seeing nowadays. Because it costs a couple hundred bucks, a Bitcoin or two, to get, well, nowadays, a half of a Bitcoin or so, to get a piece of malware written on the dark web. It's really, 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 really trivial. You can get ransomware now as a service, even, where you sign up and they'll give you a support number, 800 number to call when you know the ransomware attack is not working right. And, Re SLAs, we guarantee that you'll, I'm dead serious, it's very available and it's dirt, dirt cheap. So the attacks are going to get more sophisticated and the ability to see that something bad has come onto my network is going to get more and more difficult. File comes in through email via OpenDXL because we're able to trigger on this is unknown. We can't identify this as good or bad. We can build into the infrastructure, hey, Toss this off to my sandbox and do a deeper analysis of it via whatever, maybe code unpacking, code analysis, dynamic static analysis, maybe sandboxing, whatever have you. But throw it over here so we can investigate it. What pops out of that investigation? IOCs. IOC stands for Indicator of Compromise. So this is a bad behavior that this thing does. It creates X bad file with such a hash. It cre goes to X IP address that we've determined is bad. It does X bad behavior whatever have you. Those IOCs are key to protecting our network. So in the case of, and I hate picking on them because they're good people, but they're easy target because everyone probably has heard of them, Target, the company. In the case of Target, they had the IOCs for that piece of malware called Jack POS that was sitting out on their cash registers from April-ish up until Black Friday, stealing credit card numbers. Their devices knew the IOCs. The, the, the IOCs lived up there on those devices. So the device knew it was bad, knew what the bad behaviors were, knew how it looked, but what was missing is this following step right here. Publish those IOCs out to the rest of the network using DXL. That's what we allow you to do now with the DXL technology. Now your endpoints know those IOCs. So the endpoints now can do what an endpoint software would do. Hey, this IOC is bad, 
I'm going to block that file. This IP address is not allowed. I'm going to not allow traffic to that IP address. This IP address is giving me a dropper. I'm going to block that IP address from dropping any files on my system. Why? Because it has visibility into the IOCs. Your checkpoint next, next gen firewall can now say, hey, I've now received that this IP address equals bad. Maybe I shouldn't let anyone in my network communicate out to that IP address at all. That's what you can do with DXL. Important caveat or not caveat, important piece of detail. That entire process that I just showed, not counting the analysis, because the analysis can range from 60 seconds to 90 seconds to certain devices may, might take minutes to do it. But regardless to the analysis, the whole process from handoff to be analyzed down to, hey, we found the IOCs and let me tell everyone about it, that time is measured in nanoseconds. So it is instantaneous. That's the whole point of DXL. So if you got endpoints out in a Starbucks in Saskatchewan, you know, sitting there doing some remote work, instantaneously they should be aware that we have now become aware of a new threat in our environment and you need to be updated about it. That's what DXL allows you to do. Let's take that use case to kind of the next level. And after this, I'm going to hand off to Jesse to go into the actual code, because I know that's what you guys want to see. And we'll be here for questions afterwards, so if you have questions. Matter of fact, does anyone have any questions? Thoughts, comments? Go ahead, sir. Oh, one second. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks uh, for reminding me, Jolly. Uh, Sticks and Taxi are protocols that are very popular for passing IOCs between um, devices and so forth. Um, is, is the advantage uh, speed, security, and, uh, and by your perception? Intelligence or describing IOCs and passing them around. Confidence, McAfee is probably the oldest and definitely either the number one or number two largest pure place security company in the world. But still, in spite of that, I'd be lying to you if I said the adoption on this is crazy high, everyone's using it. No, because if you're using Cisco in your network, Cisco has something called PX Grid you're probably going to leverage PX Grid. If you're using, you know, if you're a bank, banks love sticks and taxi. You're probably leveraging sticks and taxi. If you are, and I could go on and on and on, everyone thinks they do it well. I will say though, what I'm starting to see now, because my clients are some of the largest companies in the world, banks in particular, power companies, they are now coming to us saying, we've been trying to build this for years. We can't get it to work. We're going to go ahead and leverage your technology. And some of those banks use our stuff on their endpoints. Some of them don't use us at all, but they see value to integrating this. But I would encourage you, do not wait for market adoption to do this. That's the point of being open. The point of being open technology is, we don't care who adopts it and how you adopt it and what you're using it for. As a matter of fact, a true open standard mindset to have is, you should use my stuff and don't even tell me about it. Download it, get to crack and use it for whatever and have a nice day and that's, that's all I need to know about it. And that's the paradigm we're trying to go with. So adoption isn't it. I think performance and security are it. Yeah, so we have a better infrastructure for managing the performance of it. We have a really, really good infrastructure, which is free, you can download it as well, for managing the keys and the who's allowed to communicate on it, et cetera, et cetera. You had yeah, something so, to add, Jesse? So I was gonna say that Taxi could actually be um, the application le level protocol that would ride on yeah. top of DXL. So we could write a wrapper that, that would take taxi protocol conversations and ride over the DXL to act as the communication plane between any two endpoints in the DXL fabric. And that's really the goal. As, before I give you questions, because I'm already getting the drop dead, stop talking sign in the back. For, yeah, that's drop dead, stop talking. I could talk for 15 <laughs> minutes in my sleep, dude. <laughs> um, so um, speaking about taxi specifically, Let's take this use case to the next level. So we now know about the IOCs and they're bad and we know as of this second, nothing in my environment should be allowed to start running those bad files or go, bad, go to bad IPs. We know that as of this second. What about the guy that 15 minutes ago downloaded that file out at Starbucks and has it sitting on his desktop? What about him? He hasn't run it yet but it's sitting there dormant, and he's about to bring it into the network because he, you know, he was a sales guy, he was on the road, he picked it up in Starbucks, Now, because someone in Starbucks just stood up a Wi-Fi pineapple, which by the way, if you don't know what a Wi-Fi pineapple is, that is probably the best thing I've ever seen raffled at an event like this. <laughs> amazing piece of tool. If you are remotely into hacking, cybersecurity, want to learn about it a little bit, 
absolutely put a card in and get that raffle piece. That was amazing. Anyway, sorry, side, side show advertisement for Hack5. Kudos to Hack5 for putting that together. Um, so you, get the, you, you got hacked and you have that file sitting there now, and now you come back into the environment and you have this bad file. What we find a lot is right here going into your SIM, which is a repository of all your logging information, um, is typically communicated into a taxi. So there, we can take via DXL and publish through taxi into the SIM and tell the SIM, you know what, I need you to do a historical backtrack backwards into time, because if you look at the clock, it's spinning backwards, and check who prior to this second, maybe 90 days backwards, has touched those IOCs that we're talking about. Who's touched that file? Who's gone to those IP addresses? And give me a list of those systems because those systems, I wanna go and you know, send a ticket or send a tech out to take a look at them. With DXL, we can make your SIM aware of it and the list of systems that I get back from that SIM saying these three systems, you need to check them. With DXL, I can ping out, not just alert my technicians that hey, go and check those two systems, I could actually completely quarantine them out. Why? Because we've had technology in the space for ages called NAC. But why is NAC probably one of the most underutilized tools? Because it's highly complex to manage. If I'm NAC is the ability to manage a list and say these people are allowed to be on the network, and if you're not on that list, you're not allowed to be on it. So when the CEO buys a new Apple iPhone and he comes into the office, doo -doo -doo, and he plugs it in and tries to communicate, it's not working, and that's a pain, and that's why we turn our NAC off. This allows you to leverage NAC quickly because we can react to, we know for sure these two systems have something bad on them, so I'm gonna block those two off of the network right away and quarantine them so that they can't spread the, va the malware or the, the Petya or the WannaCry malware or whatever have you any further through the network. That's what you can do with OpenDXL. And I got a couple more slides. I'll be here for questions if you have thoughts or questions. But I want to pivot over to Jesse so you can get into it. Jesse, all yours. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Greg. Um, so first of all, really cool that we're live streaming. Um, I, too, had to tell my wife that uh, I actually was here. So Nicole, I hope you're taking notes. There will be a, a quiz when I get home. Um, <laughs> so this is, uh, I wanted to start just talking a little bit about the ways to get started with OpenDXL integration. Um, are we sending the slides out? Are folks going to have access to these? Okay. Yeah. So, so that was originally internal, which is why I was asking. Um, so, um, and, and we can update these to make sure that they're they're fit for distribution. But, um, so one of the things that that I wanted to talk about is what it took to get started. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's it's definitely it's, it's okay. Fine. These have these have been vetted since then. Um, so, so, of course, the first thing is Python. The SDK right now is released as Python. Um, how many folks here are Python coders? All right, about half the room. That's awesome. So you guys are halfway there already. Um, and as you know, Python is incredibly simple to import. Libraries bring. So great question. Two point seven is what this is. Is what the SDK is released in. Um, so there is a couple of elements to this how-to, how to get started. Um, if you're using pip, use pip2 if you've got both installed. So just make sure of that. Uh, and then OpenSSL, as Greg mentioned, it all rides off of uh, SSL layer 5 protocol. So make sure that uh, when you're setting this up that you set up your certificate and key pair as well. And then you'll use that to create your authentication chain inside the PKI administration in EPO. So anybody that has our endpoint product, you should already be familiar with EPO and how to use it, it's very simple. Um, there is an interface to go ahead and get your PKI set up here. Then you're also going to export the broker, which is part of tied to the, the DXL infrastructure. You're gonna export that key information um, because that'll be included inside of your configuration file for your DXL client, right? And that's important for that mutual handshake. And then lastly, as, as Greg mentioned, understanding topics uh, and authorization of those topics, right? So, so sometimes you might want to make sure that only certain endpoints will have access to what you're broadcasting over the DXL message bus. A message bus is a lot like a network hub, right? So we use these topics to turn that hub into something more akin to a switch. So now only the folks that are on that topic will receive the messages that you place there. So 
Um, again, uh, we're, we're in PyPy, so you can use pip install to get the libraries and the SDK included. They'll decide on your use case. So do you want to do a publish subscribe or a client server? Again, we, we, we recommend writing some service integration wrappers so that if you have traditional RESTful APIs, you can expose them to the DXL bus. Uh, incredibly valuable. Uh, right now, there are three main SDKs that are provided through uh, GitHub. Uh, that is the, the DXL client itself, so you can pretty much write any application you wanted. It doesn't have to integrate with a McAfee product. It could be anything. Any two applications could integrate. Um, and then decide on the topic, right? So how do you want to set up your authentication and authorization inside of your project? So uh, we have a, a, an example online as well, 61 lines of code. Very simple, very easy to understand. Um, I'm going to breeze through these really quickly. Uh, so while Jesse's breezing, let me just comment on something he just said, 61 lines of code. Most of the integrations I've seen, and I have customers doing integrations like that one that I just showed with the ping pong ball bouncing around, I've seen that actual integration built between um, a Palo Alto firewall, which Jesse has actually done one of those as well, um, and McAfee endpoints and a Q radar sim. So, you know, very separate, very competitive. I think it was less than 200 lines of Python code. And I say that to say, the nature of this style of integration, because of the publish and subscribe, you're not required to build out integrations one for one from each the separate technology. You make an integration from your next gen firewall, for example, to the DXL bus, and you put all of its content in a topic, um, alerts from my next gen firewall, and you only let the relevant things subscribe to alerts from my next gen firewall, so that makes your code base and what you need to maintain significantly less than if you were building out old school API integration where you're making an integration from the next gen firewall down to the FireEye, next gen firewall to the endpoint, next gen firewall to the curator. Every one of those would have taken 100, 200 lines of code and now you are responsible for maintaining 600 lines of code. We have drastically changed the paradigm on that to make it easier for enterprises, corporations, governments, et cetera, to get into the game of, hey, let me make this integration myself because I know what technologies I have. Go right, 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 right. And that 61 lines of code, that includes comments and white space, right? Not to mention about, about maybe 30 lines of that um, are all about the build up and the setup of the, the rest of the code. So, so that'll be repeatable, right? So the next time you write integration, it'll probably be that same 30 lines that kind of heads it off. It's your imports, it's, it's maybe static definitions, any kind of config file information you want to put into it. Um, so that'll be repeated over and over again throughout your separate projects. Um, but one of the, the ones that I wanted to example for you all is, I, there's about six integrations that I've authored that are on GitHub in the OpenDXL community. Overall, there's, there's dozens and dozens. I think we're, we're probably in the hundreds at this point since we opened up in November. Um, but uh, uh, one of the key ones that we've integrated was Cuckoo Sandbox. Is anybody familiar with Cuckoo? Cool, all right, cool. More hands than I expected. Um, so, so Cuckoo is an open source sandbox technology which does dynamic analysis on potential samples of malware, right? So if there is a zero day, you hand it off to Cuckoo, you ask Cuckoo to run it, and then based on the results, it goes through several rounds of processing and analytics. Um, it's all open source, so we'll see signatures come out on a regular basis, we'll see processing modules come out on a regular basis, and they'll integrate with things like MongoDB and, and other reporting mechanisms. Um, so what I did was, and you'll see in the little green section on the diagram here, is I integrated in two locations. Integrated at the processing stage, where we evaluate what uh, the results are from, from Cuckoo, and we assign it some values, and then I integrated at the reporting stage. So what we've done is in the processing stage, uh, now, now the nice thing about Cuckoo is that it's also written in Python. So in order to integrate into Python, it's very simple. Right? I can write a module and use the native classes that have come down from the SDK. 
On the left-hand side is the setup. Again, this is going to be the same. We're going to see this as being consistent throughout, right? So the imports are very similar. Uh, the, the configuration definitions are very similar. But on the right-hand side is where it gets interesting. So from a processing perspective, what we're doing on the right-hand side is we're saying, take some of those key points of information from the Cuckoo processing result and ask TIE, or Threat Intelligence Exchange, over the DXL fabric, ask it for reputation information that McAfee might already know about. So we use things called file providers. These things provide reputation scores or trust levels for, for an existing sample that you ask it. These include GTI, which is our cloud-based reputation service. So if you have our endpoint solution or any of our analytic solutions, um, you'll have GTI integrated into that. Uh, ATD, which is very similar to Cuckoo, but on an enterprise scale. Um, we also have a, a web gateway, and, and there's some more coming out in the next, in the next uh, couple quarters. But anyway, so we're asking that, give us any reputation score that the environment might already be aware of. Um, maybe it's something I've written, right? I, I personally have come in and I said, look, there's this new IOC, put it in tie, and when Cuckoo runs, it'll pull out that trust level that I've assigned it and write it to the, to the Cuckoo report. The second part is in the reporting module. Um, so once all of the execution has been completed, all the analytics on your malware sample has been completed, what do we do with it? Uh, one of the new features that have just come out in the last couple of months for Cuckoo version two is that it comes up with a, a risk assessment or a score of the overall sample. So now it'll return something like a, a two digit, it's a, it's a, a float, float, so it'll be like a 5.5. It's basically a 0 to 10 scale, 10 being most malicious. And we'll say, if that score is above a 5, then tell Ty to protect the environment. And just like we saw that animation from Greg's presentation, as soon as Ty is aware that this is malicious because the sandbox just detonated it and discovered it's malicious, it informs the entire environment. So if you had 50,000 endpoints deployed across your ecosystem, what that would mean is all 50,000 endpoints are now protected from that zero day. So it really helps to eliminate and manage that residual risk when we think about traditional threat management. So I wanted to do a, a quick presentation, a quick demo here of how that would work. Let me, let me do a quick time check. How are we looking on time, Jolly, Tom? 10? Perfect. Awesome. Your time check got me. No. <laughs> so we start by opening up a screensaver, right? We got this executable. It's so cute. Who wouldn't open up a cat looking through a mouse hole? I mean, obviously, we want to see what this looks like. Um, we don't know who sent it to us, but still, it's too interesting to resist. Uh, as soon as we double click it, we see that some interesting stuff is happening in the background. Uh, a file's written to the disk. Now nothing's happening, so I'm, I'm ultra curious what's going on now. Um, and then eventually, the screen goes blank. And we see there's, there's a notice for some ransomware. So particularly interesting for me because I've never seen it before. It's zero day. How do I protect the environment? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll back my VM. I'll reset it to a clean state. And I'm going to head on over to the Cuckoo sandbox. And I'll submit that cat screensaver example uh, into Cuckoo. Now, if you've ever used Cuckoo, you'll know that the full analytics of this takes about five to seven minutes. We don't have five to seven minutes, so the video speeds up a bit. Um, this will run through in about 15, 20 seconds. And what we'll see when we kick this off is that uh, the modules that we have written are now included inside of the details of your, of your output. So we'll see like tie update as part of the reporting module. Cuckoo's pretty neat. Takes snapshots um, of the sandbox machine, of the guest OS. So if there's anything interactive, anything occurring on the screen, you'll get that included in your reports. I'm going and to jump ahead. That type of technology for doing um, analysis of malware, it's existed for a long while. Cuckoo is it. There's several commercial products that do this. So we've always had the ability to analyze malware and pretty accurately predict when, hey, this thing is going to do something bad. Where our problem has historically been is sharing that intelligence that we've gained out with the rest of the environment. Continue, Jess. Yep, yep, so. Um, let me get it started back where it was. Sorry about that, guys. 
Okay, so when it's completed, we'll go ahead and kick off the Cuckoo API because I, what I want to do is now go and check out the report that Cuckoo has produced. And remember that this now includes our integration module that has our integration into our threat intelligence exchange capability. So I'm going to load up report 50 for, for sample 50 that we just submitted. And we'll see that now there's this section for McAfee tie. So any of the results that we'll get from McAfee's tie integration will be included in the report uh, from Cuckoo. But also, and, and in my opinion most interesting, is that now there's an entry inside of our threat intelligence exchange database, which includes the IOC that we just submitted to Cuckoo. We get details, on, and, and the most important part of that is that it's now most likely malicious. All of the endpoints are now aware that that executable is malicious, and now we get a dramatically different result when we execute that sample. And the result is um, that that sample gets blocked. Based on your policy inside of McAfee's endpoint solution, this could end up being cleaned as well, so it would remove it from disk. Um, that was just a good uh, example to provide. And, and then lastly, through Threat Intelligence Exchange, we can do a, a real-time lookup of any of the endpoints inside of the environment that might have been impacted by that same IOC, right? So this gives you full breath, closed loop, remediation and, de and detection. How are we doing on time? Two minutes? Okay, so just really quickly, um, you mentioned iMessage. There's another chat protocol out there that uses uh, MQTT, anybody know it? Okay, Facebook Messenger uses MQTT as well. Um, I didn't know that until I had already written this OpenDXLQ chat. So this is more of an experiment for me than anything. Um, it's called QChat. It's an experiment in SOC incident response. And the goal was to take advantage of the DXL architecture and leverage it to create a chat system for incident responders in the field. Um, I, I've, I've worked in incident response in the past. I've worked in a SOC in the past. Um, I've managed SOCs globally for a, a pretty large MSSP. And, and one thing we found was that getting global coverage inside of an incident response task is pretty difficult. Um, and, and one of the things that's important is how do we set one up where I don't need a centralized set of infrastructure to manage the chat sessions, right? I want to keep my chats ephemeral. I want to keep them from being saved to any kind of server or anything on disk. And one of the ways we can do that is by leveraging DXL. So what I did was I wrote a kind of an all-in-one package that is both client and server. And everybody talks to everybody that's on that DXL message bus. Um, each topic, each unique topic, is its own chat channel. So as users enter the channel, um, they will be able to participate with each other inside of that message bus. So again, very similar setup code. Um, run code here is broken up into three sections. Uh, the first section on the left is all about uh, message handling. So there's four message types built inside of this proof of concept. Um, everything on the left is message handling. Everything on the right is, uh, is message response. And then everything um, all the way to the right, the third page of code there, is about the UI. So kind of basic user interface stuff. So this, this will be a really quick demonstration of what that would look like. Um, and the beauty of it being on DXL is that we could take advantage of the other features of DXL. So if I'm an incident responder and one of the IOCs come acro comes across inside of the chat, I can immediately take action on that IOC, right? I can identify where else it's been seen inside of the organization. I can see if we already have a risk level associated with it inside of the threat intelligence exchange. Um, and I could even begin to drive action. So I could begin to remediate through McAfee's active response, which is also in the DXL. Um, so that we can really control the, the incident through um, the OpenDXL QChat application that I wrote. How many lines of code? Uh, this one is 320 all in one Python. For script. an entire collapsible, zero infrastructure required um, chat program. This is pretty impressive, in my opinion. Yeah, thanks. And that includes comments and white space, right? That includes comments and white space. Yeah, yeah. Some lines are long, so I had to create new lines for it. So, um, so if anybody's interested, there's, you know, the code again is on uh, GitHub, OpenDXL-community. Um, so just a quick summary. Uh, we talked about four simple requirements to get started. Uh, we showed two examples of how easy it is to write 
both DXL integration and how we can think outside of the box a little bit creatively on how we can take advantage of the DXL architecture to do something that might not necessarily have much to do with the McAfee products inherently, um, but ultimately can end up tying in and help to reduce your overall levels of effort when you do things like incident response, just as an example. Um, and, uh, and just one quick plug here, if anybody starts to write open DXL code for integration or, or sandboxes or anything like that, um, please, please, please submit open DXL on GitHub. Okay, guys, this is, uh, this is what's gonna help drive the community to a safer place. Um, at, we're all partners in that, so thank you. Do we have five minutes for questions, Tom? Any questions? I, yeah, I knew there were some left over. Fire. And these questions are to me and or Jesse, so have that. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, the mic is coming. We'll, we'll share one. Uh, how does the, um, how does it know when to escalate to say, I guess, um, sending out a ping to all the machines saying there's been a, a virus. So point, point being sometimes uh, with IDS, if you're like pen testing a company, you'll Actually, want to if you if you want to get an initial foothold, you actually flood it with fake uh, attack uh, strings. So to actually, so it starts escalating high high valued assets. Uh, uh, so they pay pay attention to that while you get a foothold in like a printer or something. Uh, how does it know when to uh, escalate versus say start you know so it doesn't get overloaded? Um. It's going to be based on the policy that you have set on your IDS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not some secret magical thing that knows, hey, that's the bad one right there. We're not pretending to do that. All we're doing is sharing the relevant threat intelligence. So if you have a policy on your IDS, which you probably should, especially if it's in D, um, the tech mode, um, where it says, look, if we're getting um, suddenly flooded with a bunch of alerts, you don't want to necessarily just, you know, spam the, the, the sock and say, hey, we just got 100,000 alerts. You might want to collapse them down and say, look, here's one alert that says we're getting attacked uh, with, with this specific type of a flood. Those are the types of levels of alerting that you will have, and you would build that into your DXL infrastructure as well. So it's only the communications bus it leverages the existing policies that you have in your environment. Other questions? A lot, a lot of attacks happen in-house, so they're not coming through the firewall, and they're not gonna be detected by the intrusion detection systems. Are there um, plugins for things like Apache modules or Node.js or IIS that you guys have written so that if a notification happens, these web servers are uh, I, protected. I, I, haven't, I personally haven't written. I'm pretty sure Jesse has not written. There, I, I've, I've, seen some for, I've seen some integrations for authentication schemes. So um, there's an integration on OpenDXL for GitHub um, that, that'll take log messages, uh, basically like a host-based IDS that works just off of log detection on side of Linux systems. Um, and and it, the, the integration code determines what's important and puts that back onto the DXL. I have seen that integration. Um, I think that's a great idea for a use case. Exactly. And if there's, anybody, yeah, if there's anybody in the room, including yourself, sir, that might want to develop that, the community would thank you for it. So yeah. That's good. exactly where I was going with my answer. The key with the openness of the DXL bus and the infrastructure is if the integration doesn't exist, have at it. Any other questions? That was painless and sweet. Oh, there is one, sorry. Um, since uh, work in a dev development environment, you're not necessarily going production right away. And to write these with the, the client API, is there a, a prototype server I could use that I would work with my integration before I go live? Yeah, on, the DX, on that community page, is the link actually up there? Yeah, open the Excel GitHub community. There is actually a sample server infrastructure based on, I think, CentOS or one of those free Linux infrastructures where you could just deploy and get it up and running immediately. One of our other engineers, his name is Scott, he actually built that out and that's published up there as well. So, so, yes. so and you bring up a good point too around, around cost, right? This isn't part of something we sell. This is inherent to our endpoint solutions, DXL specifically. So if you get anything with EPO, which is included on in our endpoint management solutions, 
um, DXL comes with that, so you could stand that up. And in our latest release, um, it's no longer appliance-based, so you could put the DXL broker, which is the server infrastructure, in public cloud as well. So you could deploy this in Amazon or you know, Azure or something like that. Uh, excuse me, we're in a Microsoft building. Azure, of course, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <clears throat> In IoT case, how do you authenticate all the, those things, IoT uh, things? How, how uh, there are many IoT things, you know, and each you have to authenticate. How do you do it if, in your case? How do we authenticate? Yeah. Is that what you asked? How do we authenticate all the, uh, yeah. all, all the all endpoints all for IoT? Those, yeah. How do you how do you start? How do you start with each of, the, of, each of uh, things? Yeah. We spoke about IoT in the earlier session, and the same problem exists to answer your question. IoT devices are typically so small in terms of CPU processing prop, um, ability, um, the amount of code base you can write. A lot of the OS is hard coded or burned onto a piece of firmware chip. So that's the, the, the barrier that you have to overcome. Yeah. How are you going to get that code written on the, the IoT those, device? Those requirements. If you can do that at a, ma at a, at a manufacturing level, right. problem solved. But right. an end user, you're, it's going to be kludgy. Yeah, you'd have to jailbreak it or something like that, right? Because those requirements don't go away, the first set of requirements that I started with. So those, those four things, you need to be able to get Python code on there. You need to be able to get SSL certificates on there, right? And, and, and you need to be able to set up the configuration for your code. So th and now we segue to Tom. Remember, I promised we're going to re-raffle the raffle item box. that was raffled? All right, so we had some, some new um, items in here. Um, but first, let's give you guys a round of applause for their, their diligence.